the thing about hip hop uh, today is it's smart. It's insightful. The, the way that they can communicate uh, a complex message in a very short space is, is remarkable. And a lot of these kids, they're not going to be reading the New York Times. That's not how they're getting their information. My hip hop will rock the shop the nation. Hip hop culture is more than music. Peace to you. We speak the truth. Show them what peace can do when they're raised for you. My hip hop will rock the shop the nation. Rap is something you do. Hip hop is something you live. So hip hop didn't invent anything. But hip hop reinvented everything. Peace and love, everyone. My name is Manny Faces. For 10 years, I covered hip-hop music and culture in and around New York City as an independent journalist and content creator. Despite the attention the mainstream music business started giving to areas outside of hip-hop's mecca, New York remained a thriving, bubbling, evolving artistic and cultural ecosystem. This includes many people and organizations who use hip-hop in incredibly innovative and inspirational ways outside of just making music and entertaining folks. In areas like education, in schools, in youth outreach and counseling, in theater, in science and technology, in politics and activism, hip-hop is a remarkable force in New York and beyond. The voices of these innovators are as important as ever, especially as corporations continue to strip away hip-hop's wider cultural voice for the sake of profits. Because these innovators know how to use the nation's dominant youth culture in an authentic manner, in ways that can help solve some of our nation's biggest problems. So we need to celebrate and support them. Because I believe that hip-hop can save America. And so this podcast was born. Thanks again for joining me as I talk to the folks who are responsibly using hip-hop music and culture to address, adjust, and in some cases, alleviate problems facing our country. Hip Hop Can Save America is a presentation of the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy at hiphopadvocacy.org, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing public understanding of hip hop culture. We're also brought to you by the award winning Newsbeat Podcast. It's hard hitting journalism, including interviews with thought leaders and activists about the most pressing social justice issues of our time. And it also incorporates hip hop with music and original lyrical contributions every episode. Think of it as Democracy Now! and Black Thought had a podcast, baby. You can find Newsbeat by Maury Creative Studios wherever you get your podcasts or on the web at usnewsbeat.com. Hip Hop Can Save America airs weekly, Tuesdays at 10 p.m. on Bonfire Open Source Radio. With amazing programming like their flagship morning show, TK in the AM, Bonfire Open Source Radio is leading community radio into the future. Check them out at bonfireradio.com or on the TuneIn app. We're also available on most podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Stitcher. So a lot of this season's episodes focused on hip hop being used in the classroom as a method of engaging students. Much of this has to do with the idea that music has always been a tool for teaching and that hip hop, because of its vast lyrical and stylistic components, can be referenced, adapted, and used to translate complex ideas in a language young people can relate to. But for young people, particularly African Americans, there's a special relationship with hip hop. It's the culture. And many progressive educators understand that this cultural connection is not only helpful, but mandatory when considering how to best educate today's youth. One of the leaders of this line of thought is Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. Her theory and research around culturally relevant pedagogy has been foundational in forward thinking educational circles. And many of today's leading hip hop educators are proving her work to be vital in improving how we teach our kids. She is, as some refer to her, the OG at this. And it is fitting that it is with Dr. Latson Billings that I wrap the first season of Hip Hop Can Save America. And real quick, a special shout out to Bonfire Open Source Radio for carrying this show this season. And I encourage everyone to go to bonfireradio.com to get more information about the 2018 Bonfire Audio Festival, part of the sixth annual Brooklyn Wildlife Festival at Gamba Forest. Brooklyn Wildlife runs from August 31st through September 9th and features more than 150 performers over 12 events. It's great. Uh, the Bonfire Audio Festival will take place on September 9th and will feature broadcasters from the Bonfire Universe. Uh, I'll be joining fellow host Chris Carr of Not Radio and select guests for conversations about hip hop, the art, the business, and the culture. Uh, I hope to see you there. In the meantime, here's my conversation with the one and only Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. If you could, just, you know, the basics, your, your, your name and, uh, and rank and serial number and affiliation, if you could, please. 
Well, I'm Gloria Latson Billings. I am Professor Emerita from the University of Wisconsin, where I was the Kellner Family Chair in Urban Education, also a faculty affiliate in Ed Policy Studies, Ed Leadership and Policy Analysis in Afro-AM. Uh, I am currently the president of the National Academy of Education. Dr. Lassen Billings, I just want to thank you for taking the time out to speak with me. Big fan of what you do, and it's a, just a pleasure for me uh, to spend some time with you today. And I thank you for your time. My pleasure. As many of us do, I would imagine you you wear several hats. <laughs> uh, how how would you currently define who you are right now from a, a professional standpoint? Well, uh, in many ways, I've become a, an independent scholar because I've actually just formally retired from the University of Wisconsin. Um, but I've always said to my students, there's a difference between having a job and having work. So while I don't have a job, I have plenty of work. And much of that work is professional development work with teachers, particularly teachers who are going to be working with kids in urban uh, spaces. So your work is, uh, I guess, largely teaching teachers to be better teachers? Yes. Got it. A theory that you, of course, widely recognize for is this concept of culturally relevant pedagogy. In recent years, you've remixed that theory a bit. So I, I wonder if you could just briefly talk about what that theory meant when you developed the, the idea, the concept, and how you've now modified it uh, over the years. So we're talking work that began some 30 years ago, where I was very puzzled by the fact that there seemed to be nothing in the literature that suggested that we could be successful with urban kids, and particularly African-American and Latino kids. And I just knew that wasn't so, even with an N of one myself. I knew that there were teachers who knew how to work with our kids. Uh, So I began studying these teachers. What came out of of that three-year study was what I call culturally relevant pedagogy. If you fast forward to the last mm, maybe eight, ten years, you'll see a shift to work with people like Django Paris and H. Samuel Lean, uh, even Chris Emden, talking about notions of culturally sustaining pedagogy. And while I still use the term culturally relevant, I understand the need to be thinking about pedagogy a little bit different. One of the limitations of my work is I was looking in elementary classrooms, and I looked in those classrooms because they're more convenient from a research standpoint. You know, you could say one teacher, 27, 30 kids all day. And it's just easy to to manage from a research standpoint. But I myself have a more secondary background. And I know that's a more complex organization where you may have as many as 150 kids in a day. By taking the convenient sample of the elementary classroom, what was a big uh, limitation of my work? is that I did not get to what I call youth culture. Adolescents are really the carriers of youth culture. It's not to say that elementary kids aren't aren't aware of it, but you're more likely to see the aesthetics, the fashion, uh, the arts, uh, all of the the important aspects of uh, youth culture identified with adolescents. You're not going to see it as much on young kids. So I knew I had missed that particular opportunity. And as I began to look at the impact of youth culture, I realized it was important to make a shift. So is this where, um, I guess, hip hop starts to play a role? Yes, indeed. Now, in some ways, I back into to this because you may or may not know that the University of Wisconsin, Madison has the nation's first hip hop arts scholarship program. Right. Um, and I, you know, always knew these young people, went to their uh, performances, supported them. I sat on the board. Uh, but a number of them came to me complaining about our teacher education program. And I needed to figure out a way to try to help them. Now, my immediate way to help them was I started helping them design what we call on our campus independent majors, where they come up with a coherent rationale for why they needed to have a particular plan of study. And then when they do that, we come up with the courses that make sense for that plan to study. And I thought that was going to be satisfactory for them. But over time, I kept getting young people saying, no, we want more, we want more. 
In some ways, it was just their way of saying, we need you to teach us something. Mm -hmm. So uh, we came up with a a course idea. Uh, We had a series on campus already called Getting Real. So we connected it with the Getting Real series, which was a lecture series. brought in a combination of scholars and artists to talk to students about making that transition into art and the kind of pedagogy or the kind of teaching and learning that their art encapsulated. So we had wonderful people. We had Mark Lamont Hill. We had Dr. E. Elaine Richardson out of Ohio State. We had Dawn Alyssa Fisher and Davey D. We had Ebro Darden to talk about the business end. We had Mark Anthony Neal from um, Duke. Coleman Domingo, who was a fabulous artist of stage and screen. These people got to they gave public lectures, but they also interacted with our students uh, one-on-one. So we did two courses. The first course was called Pedagogy, Performance, and Culture. The second course was called Pedagogical Flows, uh, Hip Hop in the K-12 Classroom. I had uh, eight Sammy and Leem Skype in. I had uh, Chris Emden come and interact with the students. So That's kind of how the ball got rolling for me with hip hop and education. Marta Diaz out of uh, NYU, uh, David Kirkland. I mean, we just had great people come to to work with our folks. Got it. So once you, I guess, started uh, realizing that hip hop as a as a vehicle, as an avenue, as something that should be taken into consideration, you, you, you speak in your in one of your talks about students needing to be multicultural aware. Mm hmm. How does hip hop, uh, if you could talk a little bit about how hip hop enables that? So one of the things that we did by design with the courses is that while I reserved about half of the slots in the course for first wave students, I didn't want it to be a first wave segregated classroom. So the other half was open to the general campus community. What we saw when sort of, quote, mainstream Wisconsin students were in those courses is that they were often struggling to keep up culturally. And that had never happened to them. There was just stuff they didn't know. That was an important revelation for them because they'd always been advantaged. Come on, they're at the the, the state's top institution. They were the cream of the crop in their high schools. They were kids who always knew. Uh, I'm reminded of one of my assignments is that the students have to do an artist study. So to pick an artist, uh, tell me why they chose the artist, give me some biographical background, give me the discography, and then put together a, a set of kind of a mixtape of that artist's work uh, and why that work is significant for education, because after all, it was an education course. Right. In one of the papers, I had a young white Midwestern woman say, I chose Lauren Hill because one day in class in my small group, everybody was talking about Lauren Hill. And I said, who's Lauren Hill? Hmm. And they all looked at me like I was the stupidest person ever. (laughs) Now I know what kids feel like in my practicum classroom when Mm. I asked them something that I just assumed they should know. That kind of revelation that there was knowledge out there that many of our students had no way to access yet. They would be going out in the schools and classrooms uh, talking to kids who were very much steeped in this knowledge. Um, it was an important aspect of developing what we're calling this cultural competence. Right. As you started to bring these concepts together from from a teaching standpoint, uh, I, I know you've spoken a little bit about it in, in other uh, talks and such, but w- what were some of the pushback, any hindrances for, on an institutional basis? You said there were already things happening at, at the university that were open to this sort of way of thinking. How difficult was it to sort of incorporate some of these things now into curriculum and, and some of the actual work you were trying to do? Well, it wasn't hard for me because I was doing this near the end of my career and had already been somewhat celebrated. And yeah. so in other words, it's like, don't just leave her alone. She's, <laughs> you know, I, it might have been harder for some of the younger folks uh, who want to do this work. But I think one of the things that made the university embrace it was really just how the, the networks we were able to build 
So we're bringing people from some of the top institutions, from Stanford, from Teachers College, from Harvard. There's already a kind of cachet that was there. The other thing is that the university had really taken advantage of the way in which the first wave program kind of put it on the map. Our first waivers are so fierce. I mean, these are young people who have performed at the London Cultural Olympics. They've been on Broadway. They've been performed for the NC2A conferences, for the National Council of Teachers of English, the American Sociological. So this is we're not talking about a group of, of ragtag individuals here. These kids are artists. Right. <laughs> In right. fact, my one complaint is I think we use them too much. You know, in some ways we do them like we do the, the athletes. You, you, you kind of trot them out. And I always have to explain to people, we don't actually have a hip hop major, just like we don't have a football major. You know, they have right. to take the coursework that the university offers. Their art is what funds their scholarship. So I guess my deepest concern is that uh, as someone who is transitioning out of the formal structure of the university, I don't know who else is going to be willing to um, take this up. Do you find that um, now that this you know, hip hop ed movement, shouts to the hashtag hip hop ed, is, is gaining, I guess, popularity among educators that uh, it's becoming easier for educators to bring these concepts to, to I, I the schools? I think it's easier when they get the right grounding. I mean, to me, the thing I hate most is to go and see somebody, quote, using hip hop as a gimmick. And I really dissuade teachers from doing that. I was just in Baton Rouge last weekend and showing, uh, working with teachers who are engaged in, um, they call it STEM, I call it STEAM because we always add, it's not just science, technology, engineering, and um, math, we add the arts. And right. so the very first question that I said to these teachers was, I said, how many of you have seen Black Panther? Now, 75% of them have seen Black Panther. The next question was, how many have, of you have used Black Panther in your classroom? Not one hand. And these are science mm-hmm. teachers. So right, I literally right. made them go through a process of looking at all of the science, technology, engineering, art, and math elements in the film. Right. Of course, there are tons of them. This is a perfect... So I said to them, I said, this is what I mean by being hip-hop. I said, you think it's all about the music. Number one, hip-hop is made up of four uh, elements, and then the fifth element, of course, is knowledge. But I want teachers to be hip-hop. I don't want them to use hip-hop. So what do I mean by that? Right. And I give them an example of a teacher fabulous teacher. I, I hope you can interview him. He, I guess he's middle-aged right now. I would say young because they're all young to me. Um, but he teaches in the uh, Chapel Hill Carborough High School District in North Carolina. And I always tell him that he's hip-hop. And he's like, Doc, I have never played a hip-hop record in my life, in my classroom. And I said, that's not what I mean. What I mean <laughs> is you use the elements of hip-hop in your teaching. Number one, he, he knows how to flip something out of nothing. He's teaching a course that didn't exist. He's teaching a course on global poverty and and global health. Amazing course, getting his kids connected with people from around the world. And so to me, if you use Black Panther, well, that would have been flipping something out of nothing. You had no Black Panther curriculum before you went to the movies. But when we saw it, you were like, oh my God. I can use this. I mean, one of the right. questions, I said, how many chemistry teachers in rooms? So I had a bunch of chemistry teachers. I said, here's a, a, an exercise. Where would you place vibranium on the periodic table? Mm, wow. Okay. wow. I said, yes, there's a yeah. logic to the table. So if you really wanted to understand that the kids understood the table as opposed to trying to get them to memorize the table, which you know, to me makes no sense. But anyway. But that there's a logic to the table, that the gases are all together in a particular place, that hard metals are, you know, a thought exercise. We know vibranium is a made up thing. The whole thing is made up. Come on, it's a topic. It's Marvel. <laughs> but if you could get kids thinking that way. So this is the notion of flipping something out of nothing. The other thing that's sort of emblematic of, of hip hop is the notion that a, a fresh beat yesterday is a fresh beat yesterday. Stop doing that same old stuff because it was cool and hip and your that. No, 
not unless you can connect it up with what kids are dealing with today. And then the third thing I try to get teachers to look at is being creatively resourceful, figuring out how you might do a new thing despite some constraints or limited resources. To me, if you do those three things, I don't care if you never play the music, because after all, hip hop is more than the music. It is the culture. To me, that's being hip hop. Uh, I asked the teachers, I said, how many of you have a playlist in your classroom? Nobody's got a playlist. I said, you got to have a playlist. Now, one of the things you get to do as the teacher is you get to, to moderate. You get to curate. You can tell the students, if you bring me a song that's obscene, if you bring me a song that uses this, that, and the other kind of language, it's not going to make the playlist. The kids will look for the right songs. Right. But the idea right. is you're trying, you're not trying to be them. You're trying to say that what you bring to the classroom is of value. One of the ways in which I started using music by happenstance as a young teacher in the school district of Philadelphia. Uh, and it's, it's weird to me that I hadn't thought about it. But every morning when I got in, I got in early, I always turned the radio on and I'd be working. When the first bell rang, I turned the radio off, and then the kids would come in. One day, I was kind of hassled, rushing to get something done. Bell rang. I didn't turn the radio off. The kids came in, and I got up to turn the radio off, and one of the kids said, oh, Miss Billings, don't turn that off. And I was like, wow. Wow. So then I began bringing in albums, and then I had Mm. different things I would play for the kids at different times. And I also... you know, expose the kids to music they would never have listened to. Expose right, them right. to classical music. You know, if what we want to do is going to be a really uh, calm and relaxing type thing, you you know, it's not time to knock if you buck. Come on, you got you got to kind of have some, you know, we'll bring it bring it down a little bit. And, right. And sometimes I'd ask the kids, "Well, what do you guys want to hear?" And I'll never forget, I had a kid in class who could only be described by every other teacher in the school as, quote, disaffected. He said to me, can you play that song? You know, the one that goes, dun, 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 dun. I said, you, you want to hear Beethoven's fifth? He said, oh, man, that's my John. Oh, see? <laughs> so how does that get to be his John if he never gets exposed to it? Right. So it's, it's right. that kind. So I realized I've always had music. You know, if you come by my office, <laughs> you know, I'm the one with the JBL speakers. I'm the one with, you know, the the, the, the wall is rattling sometimes. Because that's just who I am. Right. And I realize I need to do this with the students. It's a good management tool. Sometimes, mm-hmm. it, you know, if, if somebody passed away, I think last, I, I might have played Al Jarreau one day, right after Al Jarreau had died. We had a whole mm. big discussion about who is Al Jarreau, why is he significant? Why would why would I play Al Jarreau here at the University of Wisconsin? Well, Al Jarreau was a was a Milwaukee. Mm. You know, it's like those little tidbits. Right. Students like, oh, we didn't know that. We didn't know that. And and Al Jarreau was very uh, dedicated to public education and left a part of his estate to mm. education. Hmm. Okay, so there's always a tie-in. Like you said, there's always ways to tie things in. What I like about the the hip hop ed movement, you know, some of the the younger instructors also help by bringing in artists or, or making connections to artists in the hip hop landscape that aren't obviously on the mainstream. Or uh, you know, the perception is, of course, that rap or hip hop, you know, it's what you hear on the radio and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, that there aren't artists today making music or or giving perspectives that are have substance, uh, have positivity, you know, all right. these different things. Right. But that's clearly not the case. And and I think what the educators are doing uh, in some ways by also, you know, looking at the um, the newer crop of artists, uh, even the Kendricks and the ch- Chances, but sometimes local artists who are actually mm-hmm. often artist activists, you know, you get to bring them into the mix as well. And, and that that helps helps fight back against that perception that hip hop doesn't have that anymore. Right. I mean, I use Jaziri X all the time. Yeah, okay, for sure. His work is just so politically motivated. Mm-hmm. Most of the teachers, they, they don't know that. And I, I say to them, for you to say, well, I don't want to use hip hop because it's, it's racist or it's violent. That's like saying, I'm not going to go to the movies because the Godfather, they had, they killed all these men. <laughs> it's a genre. <laughs> right. 
It's, right. it's like saying I'm not going to read a, a book because I read Lady Chatterley's Lover and it was pornographic. It's a genre. <laughs> So you you need to say, this is the kind I like and this is the kind I don't like. I do an exercise with high school kids because uh, I work with a cohort of high schoolers, helping them get prepared to write their um, essays for college. And I always use the same piece. I use Cool Mo D. I go to work. I love that piece. <laughs> all my age on that one. Listen, I'll tell you what, there's a, this is the kindred soul moment. My father, by the way, a distinguished professor of sociology, actually taught Cool Mo D <laughs> in a sociology class out on Long Island. So and, I'm with and you. And <laughs> I use it because, you know, first of all, the, the lyricism is incredible in that piece, but it's, he talks a lot about, he's bragging. And I say to the students, this is not the time to be the shrinking violet. You're supposed to explain to these people why you are a better choice than every other 3.6 varsity letter winner orchestra member that they're looking right. at. So we have a lot of fun with that, where they, they, they look for metaphors to describe who they are and what they are. And they love the, they love the video because it's got the, 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 the whole James... A Bond theme to a <laughs> right. white dinner jacket, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I guess I get, uh, a couple more questions while I still have you. Uh, that actually leads me to something you touched on it a little bit before. Uh, you know, I think often the perception, what I'm trying to hope to get across to, to people by talking to uh, individuals like yourself is that, you know, hip hop used in educational settings, used in all kinds of settings from health and wellness to science and technology and uh, spirituality, all these things. I think also general perception, public perception might be, well, that's great. That's the great way to reach African-American youth or inner city youth or whatever, you know, they're going to call it at that particular mm -hmm. moment, but that there are some universal applications to this kind of work. And, and while certainly the work we see being done to help young African-American youth, you know, connect to the subject matter that maybe or, or industries that they've been traditionally shut out of right. is super important. Right. What are some of the, I guess, universal ways that, you know, hip hop works to people that are not necessarily traditionally from a hip hop oriented community? So uh, let me respond to that in two ways. The, the first is I often get this question of, well, what if the kids aren't into hip hop? It, you know, right. these people thinking they teach in the suburbs or <laughs> right. wherever they think they are. And so I explained to them that, first of all, the commercial hip hop industry couldn't exist without suburban kids because y'all buy the record. We don't even buy these things, you know, we buy For sure. one, you know, but we, be, <laughs> right. you know, we burn them over and over and over. I said, so number one, your kids are supporting the industry. But the idea of what if they're not into it? Let me flip that. What if they're not into Shakespeare? Hmm. We teach what we value. Most kids are not into Shakespeare, trust me. Right. We have decided that it's of value. So, you know, I think it's really important for, for people to understand that it's not merely about, quote, black culture. Hip hop is the most commodified, monetized culture. I, I've been nowhere in the world. And I've been to six of the seven continents that I haven't. I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, coming out of a, a, having dinner one night. And man, I heard this beat in the club next door. I'm like, wait a minute, let me go in and see what this is. When <laughs> I went in there, no one looked like me. <laughs> right. So <laughs> it's not limited to black slash urban. Did it originate in the black community? Yes. There's a whole aspect of hip hop that is linked to Latino culture that we often don't talk about. All right. of the early uh, B-boys, all of them, all the best were coming out of the Puerto Rican communities of New York. Yeah, so sure. we need accurate histories of hip hop to be able to respond to, to this question of what if our kids aren't interested in it or, oh, that's okay for those kids. Right. The second thing that I want to say about that, uh, again, kind of harkens back to my experience in Baton Rouge this weekend, because I started talking about the, the knowledge economy that our kids were entering. Most of the kids who are deeply into hip hop also have sort of mad tech skills, because you have to. If you're going to, you know, do your own mixtapes, if you're going to do any of the sort of technical aspects, 
right. of the work. You need to, to, to do that. And our kids are entering an economy that we just couldn't predict. Who knew that there could be a point in your life that you could use your phone and just call some guy with a Toyota Camry come pick you up? (laughs) That's just not imaginable. Who knew that you could turn your house into a little hotel on a part-time basis? Mm. So this gig economy, hip-hop is perfect for that. Um, the skills that you can learn and understand in hip hop fit so well into this um, knowledge economy, this gig economy where people really make their own work. Mm-hmm. And we want kids to have those skills regardless of who they are. Right, right. And they do it. I mean, they're, you know, they're doing it. Young people flip the music industry on its head. Right. Uh, I was, you know. Actually, I was out this morning and I, I was laughing to myself and I said, oh, a good trick question for some of these older teachers is what label is <laughs> Chance to Rapper with? <laughs> right. Because he's not, right? right? He's like, no, no, I'm going to control the start to finish. Who's the other person who controlled their product start to finish? Stephen Jobs. Mm, right. He didn't just want the hardware. He wanted the software. He wanted the operating system. Right. He wanted it all. And it's, you know, how are you going to argue? With? Right. Indeed. Indeed. No, definitely creating uh, their own futures. There's lessons to be learned from all of this. And just as an aside, one of the things that I do and what I'm trying to do as a, as a journalist and, and what I talk about and think about is the danger of, of hip hop's, you know, true and vast culture and its associated art forms being erased, you know, or, or pushed back because of the focus on the entertainment and the pop culture. And again, that's where it ends for a lot of people. You know, there's media and corporations who largely control a lot of the imagery that's put out there, and they have little incentive to promote anything that doesn't feed into their corporate profit machine. <laughs> so bringing it into the education space when you're dealing with young people, either K-12 to or, or the collegiate level, helps that cause as well. It helps protect hip hop, the culture, from, you know, erasure right. or just being co-opted so much. Right. And I mean, I think that's always going to be a danger. And I also think one of the reasons why I have such a kind of a simpatico relationship with this generation of young people is that, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. So, you know, it's the last poets. It's Nikki Giovanni. You know, when I play that for my students, they're like, oh, my God, that's so dope. Oh, that, you know, that was sampled on such, and they, they see the connections. And they are a group who want their art to be used for social justice and activist purposes. Right, right. That helps inspire that those movements to grow and continue. We need that. Mm-hmm. Dr. Lassen Billings, I, I really, again, I thank you for that. You, you, you've answered all of my questions, obviously, with brilliant perspective. And I, I love talking to you about this. I'm going to ask you one more, if that's cool with you. So sure. the na- the audacious name of this podcast is Hip Hop Can Save America, right? And it's mm-hmm. it may be a lofty theory, but in your experience, what are the best reasons to consider hip hop music and culture when you're looking for ways, when people are looking, when we're looking for ways to truly improve lives and livelihoods and communities and relationships and fix this crazy country of ours? Well, if we think back again, I used to be a history teacher, so I'm always going to default to historical perspective for most things. We think back to the early days of hip hop in New York. One of the things it really did was it decreased the violence. You know, New York was being overrun with street gangs, but once Cool Herc, African Bombada, and those folks started having these kind of dance parties. And we've seen the the evolution from the DJ to the to the MC. We, we all, you know, talk about dope MCs, but really the early hip hop was all about That's the right, DJ. The you know? He get that loop <laughs> going over and over and over, you know. That calmed the community in a powerful way that uh, has never really been acknowledged. Uh, I believe uh, Jeff Chang in his book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, talks about, looks at the police records that the decrease in violent crime that occurred simultaneous with the rise of uh, hip hop. So we know that it's a it's an outlet. And if our young people don't have something creative to do, if they don't have a chance to express themselves, um, they'll destroy themselves and us with them. So I think it, you know, 
the arts and the humanities are indeed what make us human. We can't just be technical. We have to be artists. Uh, it was fun when I was doing the exercise with the teachers in Baton Rouge about uh, Black Panther. I said, you know, let's not forget the art. Where's the art in this? And, if, you know, they certainly recognize that almost every representation uh, in Shuri's lab or in the community, you saw these cultural paintings and what have you, because it's the art that keeps us, that holds us together, um, not just the, the, the science. So hip hop as an important art form is always going to be, going to make it significant. I remind the teachers I talk to all the time, and I said, you know, raise your hand if you ever heard someone say, oh, that hip hop stuff ain't going to last. <laughs> I said, because, you know, we're 40 years in the not last. Right. And my question to the students that I teach is, who introduced you to hip hop? The answer is almost always my parents. So I'm teaching the children of hip hop heads. I'm not, right. you know, it, it, it's going to last. Will it change? Will it shift? Of course, because that's just, you know, that's just how art right. is. Uh, and it has a, I mean, it has a long history. You know, let's, let's go all the way back to the message. Melly Mel, Mel Furious Five. Let's look at that. What were they trying right. to do? How has that changed over time? Who's still doing that? Who's doing something different? Look at the way in which people have used hip hop as a springboard to other things. I mean, come on. Who who would ever think a hip hop artist who used to run would be called upon to be in the White House with Barack Obama, right. Jay Z, right. right? So we know that it, it it has in the same way that sports and athletics provides more than entertainment. It does show some level of hope and encouragement, you know, hip hop has that same potential. Indeed. Well, I agree with you 100 percent. I appreciate the work you do spreading that message to uh, educators and, and other people in your field. I'm a, you know, I know some of the people that you, you mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm just such a fan of everyone's passion and, and desire to spread that kind of message. And I'm doing my very best to try and tell those stories so that, you know, you guys keep doing the good work and I'll do my part to tell people about it. All right. I appreciate right. that. Hip Hop Can Save America is a presentation of the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy at hiphopadvocacy.org, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing public understanding of hip hop culture. We're also brought to you by the Newsbeat Podcast, hard hitting journalism, including interviews with thought leaders and activists about the most pressing social justice issues of our time. It also incorporates hip hop with music and original lyrical contributions every episode. Think of it as Democracy Now! and Black Thought had a podcast baby. Find Newsbeat by More Creative Studios wherever you get your podcasts or on the web at usnewsbeat.com. With amazing programming like their flagship morning show, TK in the AM, Bonfire Open Source Radio is leading community radio into the future. Check them out at bonfireradio.com or on the TuneIn app. Hip Hop Can Save America is created and hosted by me, Manny Faces. I also produce the theme music. Special thanks to our associate producer, Summer McCoy. You can find out more about me at mannyfaces.com. And find out more about Summer's hip-hop and tech-related initiative, Hip Hop Hacks, at hiphophacks.com. Thank you for listening.